first presentation, I'm honored to introduce to you the recipient of the 2017 AC Redfield Lifetime Achievement Award, Dr. Bo Barker Jorgensen, professor and head of the Center for Geomicro Geomicrobiology at Aarhus University in Denmark. And this award honors major long-term achievements in the aquatic sciences, including research, education, and service to the community and to society. And Bo is receiving the Redfield Award for his fundamental contributions to unraveling the ecology and biogeochemical interactions of microbes in environments ranging from surface sediments to the deep biosphere. He studies microbiology and the processes of carbon, sulfur, and iron cycling in marine sediments, and investigates how life is possible deep below the seabed without light or oxygen. And Bo has made a lasting impact in marine biogeochemistry that has spanned his entire career, as evidenced by over 250 peer-reviewed articles that have been cited more than 32,000 times. And from the very beginning of his career, he has led the way in advances in understanding marine sediment biogeochemistry and microbial ecology. His early work in marine sediments was the first to quantify the role that the sulfur cycle plays in the breakdown of organic matter in the seabed, and demonstrated the importance of anaerobic sediments to the marine carbon cycle. He's credited with leading the development of methodologies to advancing marine sediment science, including the use of microelectrodes to understand the distribution and dynamics of oxygen in sediments, and he also led the first drilling expedition for exploration of the deep biosphere. And beyond his impressive research career, Bo has been instrumental in furthering the field as a whole through his efforts to establish the world-leading Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology, where he served as director for 15 years, as well as the Center for Geomicrobiology in Aarhus, where he's director today. So please join me in congratulating Bo Barker Jorgensen for receiving the Redfield Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, thank you so much for your kind words, and, and uh, thank you all for being here still uh, at this late hour. And uh, uh, I'm deeply grateful for this honor. Uh, was very surprised. Uh, I had not expected uh, such recognitions anymore in my lifetime. But even though you get older, uh, you always appreciate some support, someone who comes and tells you that it's OK what you're doing. Uh, we continue to need that. So uh, thank you so much for, for this award. And um, this is a, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And, and uh, I would like to take you back in my life uh, and uh, talk about how it all started, for me at least, uh, give you some of the history that is behind some of the things that we may be taking for granted today, and uh, give an impression on how, how, how did this research field start uh, for for my purpose. And um, my introduction to marine sciences was really as an enthusiastic scuba diver. Uh, I was diving in Danish coastal waters, uh, and mostly they would look uh, nice like this with some eelgrass. And, and uh, then uh, sometimes in summer, there were areas that uh, went anoxic. Uh, and this is a problem that has been uh, becoming more and more severe also in Danish waters. And uh, then the sea bottom looked like this. And, uh, and this was shocking. You could smell the hydrogen sulfide through your mask. And uh, the seabed turned black. Uh, the animals were trying to come out of the sediment. And uh, you had this uh, white coating of filamentous sulfur bacteria starting to cover the sediment. It was dying in terms of higher life. And I really wanted to understand what was happening. What was this balance between the oxy world uh, the fresh uh, aerobic seabed, and then uh, what happened when oxygen disappeared? What were the processes in the sediment? What was uh, the life of these uh, filamentous sulfur bacteria? What was their role? Uh, and, and this was the starting point. So um, I met up with uh, a coming supervisor um, who was Tom Fenchel. Uh, he 
uh, was here uh, 30 years old, had just become a full professor at Aarhus University. Uh, and um, we started in Aarhus. Uh, I was his first student. And uh, we built a field station. And um, as all kids, uh, you need to start in a sandbox with what you're doing and, and learn things. And, and uh, so I built a sandbox. And um, in that, uh, there was a floating a glass plate uh, and flowing water. I could measure oxygen intake and outlet. I could uh, take samples. I developed a technique for measuring sulfate reduction with a radio tracer. I could relate oxygen uptake of the sediment with the sulfate reduction, so aerobic mineralization with anaerobic mineralization. And uh, much to my surprise, over several months, it turned out that half of the entire oxygen uptake of this sediment model uh, was used to reoxidize sulfide. So, so after this, uh, which was my master's project, uh, I uh, then had the chance to go into Limfjorden outside, and um, we acquired a Hapskora. And uh, then, uh, summer and winter, I went out coring and uh, could measure oxygen uptake of the sediments in Limfjorden at a number of stations, measure sulfate reduction rates. Uh, quantify the sulfur cycle. And uh, again, out in this system, it turned out that uh, about half of the entire oxygen uptake uh, was used to reoxidize sulfide, that there was an almost complete recycling of sulfide in the sediment, which was uh, new at that time. Uh, I also concluded that uh, sulfate reduction was a very effective mechanism of complete mineralization of organic matter to CO2. Uh, I submitted a paper on this work to uh, L&O and uh, had problems with the reviewers. One was a microbiologist, uh, in fact, John Postgate, uh, some years before. He had published a paper that he and his group had searched for sulfate reducers that could carry out complete oxidation of substrates to CO2, and they could not be found. So uh, he was very critical when I concluded in the paper that there was complete oxidation of organic carbon by sulfate reduction. Another reviewer was a geochemist who didn't like my units. Um, so uh, sulfur uh, in sediments is supposed to be uh, noted in, in microgram per gram dry weight or such. I had it all per volume because I wanted to compare what was going on on a volumetric basis with what was going on on an aerial basis in the seabed to compare oxygen and, and the anaerobic processes. I think um, today it's well known that sulfate reducers do complete oxidation. And uh, I think uh, most people in the field now use these units. So, so you have to stand on, uh, on your arguments, um, which is difficult when you're a new PhD student. But um, it was uh, published in Bellano, and, and I was pleased recently to see that it's among the 10 most cited papers in Bellano from the 70s. So um, when I did this study, we had still not discovered that some of the radioactivity in the reduced sulfur goes into pyrite. Uh, so a young man came over from Utol and uh, helped us fix that. There was Bob Howarth, who is now the chief editor of LNO, and uh, we had a good collaboration back then. So um, with this, uh, we had started uh, what was going to be one of our main goals in science. And, um, and this was to understand the stoichiometry of the anaerobic processes, what was controlling uh, the element cycles, uh, oxygen uptake, carbon mineralization, uh, nitrate reduction, reduction of manganese iron species, uh, of sulfate, and, and um, uh, at that time, Henry Blackburn was the professor of our group, and uh, he and his group were studying the nitrogen cycling, and later, Ho Chamdok and Don Canfield in my group uh, were studying manganese iron reduction, and we tried to get the stoichiometry of, of these processes together, understand their mutual controls. I, I think um, had Alfred Redfield uh, worked in anaerobic systems, uh, he would appreciate this approach. <laughs> Um, so uh, all the time, uh, we could measure the oxygen uptake of the sediment. But 
we didn't know uh, what was the distribution, the penetration of oxygen. In fact, no one knew. So um, one day, a bright young student came in. Uh, this was Nils Peter Rathbeck uh, to do a master's project and then a PhD, and he became my, my first PhD student. And uh, we told him that uh, we thought he could build an oxygen microelectrode, which he also thought, uh, and, and then uh, he did it. And uh, with that microelectrode, we could then suddenly start to uh, determine the penetration of oxygen in the seabed and in many other microenvironments uh, in, in nature. And, and so he published his master's project in science and uh, then developed this combined oxygen microelectrode with a built-in reference. Uh, and uh, he was not really going to published that because he thought it was not that new. But uh, finally, he, he uh, agreed and published it in LNO. And, and I noted that uh, this is among the five most cited papers in LNO from the 80s. So it was good he did it. Um, so, so with this, we could suddenly analyze the distribution of oxygen in the seabed, uh, seeing that uh, there was a summer and winter variation in summer oxygen penetrated in these Danish coastal sediments, uh, half a millimeter or one millimeter, and then in winter, maybe four or five millimeter. Uh, we discovered the diffuser boundary layer, uh, which uh, sometimes controls the oxygen flux into the sediment. And uh, by determining the oxygen gradient in that diffuser boundary layer, we could calculate the diffusion flux of oxygen into the sediment. Um, this Peter Resbeck and I often worked in the solar lake uh, because uh, there were wonderful mats of cyanobacteria. This was almost a pure prokaryotic ecosystem. And uh, in there, uh, we could work with the microelectrodes, uh, determine respiration, uh, and so on, and, uh, and also photosynthesis. Uh, this was a, a new technique. Uh, we found out if you have the mats illuminated in the light under steady state and then suddenly shade them, the initial rate of oxygen decrease is equal to the rate of photosynthesis in the light. And you could do that at a 100 uh, micrometer resolution. You cannot do it uh, much less than that because diffusion over that distance is a few seconds and, and so uh, um, you cannot speed it up. But, but with that, we could then also determined photosynthesis. We still didn't know the light available. I uh, did a sabbatical at NASA Ames in the mid 80s and uh, started to work with single optical fibers to uh, understand the light distribution in all dimensions. Uh, but um, we wa wanted something simpler than that. And then we had another bright student who came, Carsten Lassen, and I told him that uh, he could build a scalar irradiance sensor, a, a spherically integrating microsensor for light, which he did within a few months. And, and as you will see, the radial uh, sensitivity distribution is uh, about as good as those large uh, spherical sensors you can get for oceanography today. Uh, so with that, we could go in with a sensor that was only about 70 micrometer and determine the spectral light coming to the cells from all directions. We also wanted to know what was the downwelling and the upwelling radiation. So for his PhD, he uh, built a cosine collector, uh, which is also close to the uh, theoretical uh, cosine distribution in its sensitivity. And at that time, also, Michael Kuhl was working with me. And uh, over some years, he gradually took over this area of research. But uh, with that, uh, we could then go into photosynthetic benthic systems and look at the photosynthesis, the light distribution. On the left graph, you can see that uh, the red line indicates 100% of downward irradiance. And so that is the light with which you're illuminating the matte surface. But if you look at the, the graphs, then uh, it turned out that the, the light that the individual cells are seeing are in terms of sensitivity or of intensity and spectral composition very different from what you illuminate them with. This was a big surprise to us. And um, so uh, because of all the light scattering, there is more light available near the surface. And uh, this light is spectrally altered, uh, 
compared to what you illuminate because of the uh, partial absorbance in the reflected light. So these curves are with one, one tenth of a millimeter depth intervals and, um, and to the right. Uh, you can see the bars show the depth distribution uh, of photosynthesis, uh, the depth distribution of scalar irradiance, spherically integrated, and then the oxygen distribution, and you have enormous oxygen peaks uh, when you have this uh, dense photosynthesis. So this was uh, some of the uh, most motivating research I've done because you do these experiments and you get the response immediately. You uh, sit and play with the sensors and, and you know the re results uh, while you're doing it. And so uh, we uh, stuck our microsensors into many different things. Uh, and uh, well, just here, uh, one example, uh, planktonic foraminifera, these uh, unicellular organisms that uh, float around in the ocean have uh, calcareous skeleton, have uh, symbiotic zooxanthellae with photosynthesis. They are also predators, so they eat little uh, nauplia of, of copper pots and such. And, um, and uh, I could uh, do microelectrode studies also of, of these. Uh, symbiotic systems. Uh, it was a problem because uh, the uh, foraminifera consider a microelectrode as potential prey. So they would grab onto the microelectrode. So you have to go in like a dart right to the test of the foram and then it would grab onto it, gradually realize that it was, was not good food and then spit it out again. And while it would spit it out, you can record the beautiful uh, oxygen profile along the spines. And then uh, uh, map uh, the profiles in light, in dark. Uh, and uh, there's a dramatic uh, gradient there. The oxygen uh, at the test surface has a turnover of five to 10 seconds. Uh, there is a pH gradient going in from 8.1 to 8.6. Uh, so the microenvironment of such a planktonic organism is quite different from that of the ocean water. Unfortunately, I had to leave this uh, area of research again and, and go back uh, to the mud. And uh, we um, then uh, worked for a long time uh, being, on being able to do measurements uh, right on the seabed. Um, there was another uh, bright student who came and asked for a master's project, and I suggested that he should build a benthic lander with microelectrodes. Um, well, um, we had help for this, of course. Uh, shortly before he started, uh, Claire Reimers had come over from Scripps and, and learned how to build microelectrodes. And uh, then we came over to Scripps and learned from Ken Smith and Claire Reimers how to build a benthic lander. And here we have one uh, still without the floats. Um, so I worked together with Jens Gunnarsson for uh, six, seven years until he left science and uh, founded the company Unisense in Aarhus, which is now producing microsensors for, for science. Um, later, Ronnie Glue came, and uh, I uh, had him build a benthic flux la lander for his PhD project. Um, so uh, he has been uh, uh, very active in that uh, research field since then. And then uh, I several times came back to these uh, sulfur bacteria that you could see on the seabed. So. Um, Petatoa here uh, is the one who makes these uh, white mats. And uh, when they make these thin white mats, uh, they live right at the interface between oxygen and sulfide. And as the, the main point here is that uh, that develops a pH minimum right at the oxic anoxic interface because of the sulfide oxidation to sulfuric acid. And um, uh, this was, though, not the normal uh, mode of life of beta toa in, in most of our inner waters. Uh, but I found out that uh, mostly they live in this um, no man's land between oxygen and sulfide. You can see on the left side, uh, oxygen penetrates uh, a millimeter um, or so, uh, and sulfide starts down at, at uh, three centimeter. And in between there, there is manganese reduction, iron reduction. Uh, but this is also where the beta toa live. They migrate up and down. And uh, it's strange, you could say, that uh, you have an organism that can glide around. It lives from the oxidation of sulfide with oxygen, but it uh, lives where there is no oxygen and no sulfide. 
Well, it turns out with radio tracer technique, uh, you can show that there is indeed sulfate reduction. These are rate measurements of sulfate reduction with radio tracer. So there's plenty of sulfide production in that zone, only it is turning over immediately. So uh, then the question is, uh, but then how do they oxidize the sulfide? Because as soon as they leave oxygen, what is their electron acceptor? Uh, they cannot take a deep breath and then dive down. They, somehow they need an oxidant. So the answer to that came only much later. Uh, at this time, then 1990, uh, I had a wonderful group of young, enthusiastic people in Aarhus. Uh, and then uh, the big shock came. Uh, I was invited by the Max Planck Society to found a new Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology in, in Bremen. And um, uh, this was a very difficult decision. We were so happy in our group in Aarhus. And on the other hand, it was an offer that one could not refuse. It was an offer to uh, have uh, our research generalis generously funded for the rest of my career uh, to do exactly what we wanted to do in basic science. And so uh, finally, uh, I decided to uh, start in Bremen. Uh, almost all the group here joined me as the pioneering group uh, in, down there. And uh, then Fritz Wittel came uh, with some of his students uh, from Munich and we started the institute. Now, as you can imagine, when you get an offer like that, uh, it is somewhat frightening because suddenly you realize that uh, you have all the options and the only limitations are your own abilities. And um, so we had long talked about how to build up such an institute. Uh, a, a new building was uh, established. And, uh, but we were very fortunate to get excellent people coming to uh, the Institute, uh, Rudi Amann, who started uh, the group of molecular ecology and then later a uh, department. Dirk de Beer heading the microsensor group, Anche Boetius, the habitat group, Marcel Koibos, the neutron group, now uh, heading uh, the biogeochemistry department, Nicole de Villiers, uh, now also a director of a department there, Torsten Dietmer. Uh, started a bridging group between the Max Planck and the University of Oldenburg. So it has been growing and growing, and uh, I think there are now about 350 uh, co-workers at the Institute, and um, uh, it is uh, developing very well. Once we got this established, uh, I had heard about uh, relatives of Betatoa off the coast of Chile, uh, namely uh, Thiaploga that look like Benjitoa. And uh, they were there in enormous masses. When you look at these photos, uh, well, to the lower left, uh, it looks like uh, the fur of a sheep. Uh, this is uh, these filaments stretching out of the sediment, uh, coating the, the surface. And um, we didn't know how they were living. This was under the oxygen minimum zone. There was nitrate, but there was uh, no oxygen. So. Um, Bo Tomdorp and Don Canfield were uh, taking part in our first expedition, and they, one of their tasks was to squeeze pore water out of these sediments. And the more they squeezed, the more they found. So when you look at the left graph, uh, this shows uh, how many milliliter they have squeezed out of a sample, and suddenly uh, nitrate uh, rose to millimolar concentration in the pore water. And what happened was that uh, these thioploca filaments popped, and they were just full of nitrate. In fact, uh, they contained several hundred millimolar of nitrate. So that was their trick. They uh, stretched out into the water, swaying in this current, and then take up nitrate. And then they dive down in their uh, uh, mucus tubes and, and uh, pick up sulfide, oxidize it to elemental sulfur that they can oxidize further, and then they just commute up and down, oxidizing sulfur with nitrate. So this was a very exciting discovery. And um, then we wanted to go somewhere else uh, to see whether there were, would also be similar, very dense thioploca communities. These were really the largest communities of uh, visible bacteria that I think that exist. And uh, we went to Namibia where there's also uh, this very strong upwelling. And uh, the big surprise there was that uh, there were really no thioploga, but there were these uh, beautiful 
pearl-like uh, large cells lying in the black mud. And um, uh, these are also sulfur bacteria. They are full of nitrate, several hundred millimolar. Uh, we call them the sulfur pearls of Namibia or, or Thio margarita namibiensis. And um, submitted the study to science. Uh, the discovery was really by Heidi Schulz. And uh, to the left, upper left, you can see the size of such a bacterium compared to a, a fruit fly. Um, science first rejected, rejected the manuscript. Um, one of the reviewers uh, was very upset that we had given these bacteria a name, and you cannot give bacteria a name if you don't have a pure culture. So, um, uh, but we insisted, and then uh, science decided that it was in fact a good story, so they used it. Uh, for PR, for science, uh, and so the news spread uh, more than any other study we have ever done. And um, Namibia made a stamp with Thio margarita on it. I don't know if any of you other microbiologists have ever had your favorite bacterium on a stamp. Uh, so, so we were very proud. And, and uh, recently, uh, Verena Salman uh, has been uh, uh, picking out individual large sulfur bacteria where you can recognize the morphology and see how they're living and then determine uh, their phylogeny by sequencing their 16S uh, ribosome RNA genes. And, um, and this has uh, really changed uh, the uh, taxonomy of these organisms. And she kindly named one of them after me, Thio margarita jocansini. Um, which is an odd organism. I was worried it was going to be an odd organism. Um, but, but the oddity was that uh, it has so far only been found inside the, um, the empty, intact, uh, siliceous shells of centric diatoms lying in the mud. And, and so they are all in these little uh, transparent glass cages. It's not known how they get in there and why they are only there and not others. But, um, well, maybe someday we'll find out. So, um, so this has been uh, an exciting discovery for this uh, large group of organisms that uh, basically all accumulate nitrate. Uh, their cells are one big vacuole. It's like an inverted plasma membrane. Uh, they have uh, membrane-bound uh, nitrate reductase. Uh, they pump uh, protons in. pH in the vacuole is about 2. Uh, it drives uh, a membrane-bound uh, ATPase, uh, and, and so it's, it's a very interesting system. So, uh, so we went back to Limfjord and to uh, the sites where we had uh, looked at Bajetoa before. And uh, sure enough, um, if you look at the left graph, uh, it shows the bars, rate of sulfur reduction. Most of it takes place in this zone where there's uh, no sulfide, no oxygen and where we thought uh, it was the iron reduction zone. And, um, and, and that is where most of the uh, Bejetoa are living. And uh, if to the right, you can see oxygen penetrates 2 millimeter, nitrate penetrates 4 millimeter. Uh, sulfide starts at 25 millimeter depth. And between there, the sediment is full of nitrate, but it's all intracellular. So uh, these organisms are migrating up and down um, they, we have now uh, studied their chemotaxis, and it, well, that's an interesting, a different story. Well, I, I need to jump in, and um, so uh, at um, um, around 2007, uh, I, I needed to go back to Denmark um, for family reasons, and uh, it was very difficult to leave the Max Planck Institute. Uh, but in Denmark, I managed to uh, get funding uh, for a new center uh, for geomicrobiology. We started from scratch. There were, we were two people who started and have been building up uh, the center. I was 60 years old at that time. I wasn't sure I could do it. But um, we are now 35 people, and, and uh, I think it's going well. And um, we focused on the deep biosphere. Uh, we have uh, been joining many drilling expeditions. And um, it was a completely different world. Uh, now we were working with uh, real geology, uh, deep cores, uh, not with these um, 
pathetically small cores that we used to, to work with. And um, uh, it is an interesting environment. Uh, you can drill down uh, all the way to the crust and, and continue to find bacteria. This uh, lower graph shows uh, the number of bacteria per vol cubic centimeter sediment uh, as a function of age. And you, it goes from 100 years. And you can see where dinosaur extinction was. So some sediments are even older than that, up to 100 million years old. And there are still bacteria living off the buried organic matter. So um, we have been looking at uh, the microbial life in these. And um, uh, one example here is uh, from a study in the tropical, uh, sorry, in the, the north, central North Pacific, uh, where in one core, 30 meter deep, uh, you can see the distribution of oxygen here. And uh, it is really. Uh, a, Life in slow motion, the respiration rate is one micromolar per 1,000 years. Uh, there are 40 micromolar there, so the turnover time is 40,000 years. Uh, and we could calculate that the rate of respiration of these organisms was about 10,000 times lower than it is in a, a bacterial culture. So um, quite recently, we have been working then on trying to understand who are the organisms in, in the sediment. And, uh, uh, here you can see one example of a study, uh, qPCR, of sediments uh, down to eight meters in August Bay, where we have been surprised to realize that there is really a systematic in the ratio between bacteria and archaea. It is not published yet, but uh, the bacteria are totally dominant near the surface, and then the archaea take over, starting at the depth where bioturbation ends. And so apparently, once you get into a, uh, an environment that is very stable and where uh, the organisms get long-term limited in their energy supply, the archaea take over. And uh, there are many suggestions of why that is. So um, these archaea are basically all unknown, not cultured. Uh, some years ago, uh, we succeeded in pulling out single cells from these sediments, uh, having them through collaboration with the Bigelow Laboratory uh, sequenced. Uh, it turned out that uh, the group Batiakeota is very predominant, and we caught one of them. Uh, and uh, it turned out to have many genes uh, for uh, the degradation uh, of proteins, peptides, uh, extracellular degradation. And uh, Karen Lloyd, who has continued this work after leaving our group, uh, together with uh, other collaborators, has managed to uh, have these, one of these genes expressed in E. coli, produced the enzyme, shown its specificity, uh, crystallizing it, uh, determining its, its uh, structure. So, so I think this is exciting that uh, you can pull one such organism out of the sediment and determine that much uh, of its potential. Well, finally, back to the sulfur cycle. There is so much still to understand. Uh, we are learning that uh, there is a cryptic sulfur cycle that is concurrent sulfide oxidation and sulfate reduction, where we previously thought there was only sulfate reduction. And um, we have done experiments with radio labeled sulfide and can see how different species get radioactive. This is all an illusion. It is all isotopic exchange, basically. So the last great discovery, that, and I'm done now, sorry, um, is that uh, when going back to these sediments where there is this no man's land between oxygen and sulfide, and where we thought uh, that the Bejatoa were the ones taking care of the sulfide, uh, it turned out that uh, there was a communication between oxygen and sulfide that was too fast to be explained by bacteria or even by diffusion. And uh, the conclusion from many experiments was that there was electrical conduction through that entire layer. And uh, that was uh, the first expectation, but then came the discovery of cable bacteria. That there are bacteria that form long cables that can conduct electricity. And they are single cells that grow in long chains. And along the chain, they, uh, they have uh, then, uh, in the periplasmic space, some filaments that uh, apparently can conduct electricity. 
and uh, they are sulfate reducers, but they live from oxidizing sulfide with oxygen. The top end is up where there's oxygen, the bottom end where there's sulfide, and then they send the electrons up. So they are splitting the two half reactions in a respiratory process, and this is really novel. And, and just as an example, that there's still so much to discover out there. So um, often we think that we are now just uh, finalizing the details of what we know already, but there are major discoveries, and, and uh, I wish I could start all over knowing what we know now. But um, these are the, these uh, cable bacteria. But um, I'll finish here, and, and I really want to, to uh, first of all, thank uh, all my colleagues and students uh, with whom I've had the privilege and pleasure to work, and, and uh, who have done the, the work that I'm showing here. Uh, it has been really fun. And I also like, of course, to thank uh, the ASPA board, the organizers of this wonderful meeting, and, uh, and then also thank the nominators uh, for this award, uh, Don Canfield, Dave Carl, Ed DeLong, and, and Bernie Boudreau. So, uh, well, all things come to an end. Uh, our center ends at the end of this year. Uh, it will be integrated into the structure of our university. I will retire by the end of this year, but I can continue as an emeritus professor. Uh, but that is the occasion for us to organize an international workshop on marine geomicrobiology uh, this August. And we have a wonderful uh, group of speakers in place for the meeting, and uh, it is still possible to apply for the limited number of uh, spaces uh, on the workshop, and, and you're welcome to apply. Thank you very much.